Good afternoon, everyone. Today is February 11th, 2013. Uh, my name is Matthew Ogden, and you're joining us for the regular Monday afternoon uh, discussion with the LaRouche PAC Policy Committee. We have several members of the Policy Committee joining us over Skype video. Uh, we're happy to welcome Diane Sayer back to the studio here with us after a long illness. And uh, we have Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. So I'll give it to you. There are some peculiar developments occurring. There are some significance, but the definition of the significance is not quite clear yet. Uh, what's happened uh, generally that we do know is there's been a shift in the pattern of discussions on this matter, which indicate that Obama is getting into an area of some trouble. The indication is that uh, the Republican Party is, in a sense, is giving up on its abandonment of its own cause <laughs> to actually participate in the uh, exposure of the frauds of Obama. Mm -hmm. And the Obama case is getting more and more weaker, weak in this process. So we have a situation which is very significant but is not yet secure. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we, I think a discussion of this matter is what we, anything we've got that goes on this is uh, crucial. Because we were just reviewing earlier this week, uh, or actually the, the end of last week, we were looking at the uh, income dra drain, Serena, and uh, there were some questions on yesterday about what had happened and so forth. And then we find that the storms have occurred, which had an effect, very significant effect on this process. So that's not to worry about things that way, about that. But the th key thing is what's happening in terms of the uh, Obama case. Obama is getting more and more boxed in, and his henchmen are being more and more boxed in and identified as being what they are or close to it. So this, we have a situation where we have a new dimension to what the campaign is now, and we're getting closer and closer to a plausible e expulsion of the president by impeachment. And that's in process. It's not by any means guaranteed. But it does mean that we have to take that into account in what we're doing. Because we, you know, we got a problem, which it doesn't affect me very much personally, but does tend to affect other people among our circles, that they get too nervous sometimes about these things, when it's better to not, not be nervous, but to be victorious instead. <laughs> There's nothing like victory to end uncertainty. <laughs> and, and we are, well, you've seen a trend earlier on this same issue. You've seen from the process of the, uh, this new renewed presidency, you've seen a, a, an accelerated rate of collapse of the credibility of the president's situation. And the fact that the president or his associates, especially on this question of the, the, you know, the, the child killing and things like that, mm -hmm. that th this uh, uh, has created a situation where the president is coming closer and closer to the impression out there among people that he is not impervious to expulsion from office for, on what he's been done. The whole process is now every day something new is coming out which tends to increase the numbers of counts of impeachment or potential impeachment of this president. Right. And I think the, what we have to consider is two things. What is happening in that direction actually, what the tempo is, and uh, what the effect is, the effect on the population of these kinds of things. Right. Well, you have a steady progression uh, since really the decision by the D.C. Appellate Court to assert the Constitution, the separation of powers, which opened up uh, a fight which didn't exist prior to that point. And then since then, through the hearings on Benghazi, the intervention that we've made with the facts behind that case into those hearings, in including what happened around Hillary Clinton, uh, and then the two hearings last week with both Dempsey and Panetta, where they made it very clear that Obama was MIA during the entire attack on the consulate in Benghazi. He received a half-hour briefing in the beginning, and that was it. He was completely gone from the scene. And then what happened with uh, the confirmation hearing of John Brennan? 
Uh, very interesting that there's a uh, closing in, as you said, of Republicans who might have been told to give up around the time of the election campaign, but have responded and said, now that didn't work and we're at the point now. Uh, what happened over the weekend, I think, is very significant going into tomorrow, where there will be closed door confirmation hearings again with John Brennan, is the publication of this book or the article about this book from these former uh, yeah. JSOC, uh, Navy SEALs or whatever they are, special operations, that in fact there was a secret war being run by Brennan and Obama without the knowledge of not only the Department of Defense, but also without the knowledge of the CIA and without the knowledge of Ambassador Stevens. And that this was happening behind Ambassador Stevens' back in Benghazi, and he was being sent into something completely blind and had no idea what was actually being run. And when you look at the implications of what this means, the fact that Brennan is not only now nominated to run the CIA, but is also the head of the kill list sessions every Tuesday, and these drone assassination programs, and the forced publication of these legal memorandum, so-called justifying the, in a Carl Schmidt type way, the, uh, the assassination program, it is all closing in around Obama now. And I did also think it was interesting that this uh, World News Daily, this WND um, uh, news uh, website over the weekend published an article called the 12 counts of impeachment against Barack Obama. And uh, one of the panel of experts that was included was none other than Bruce Fine, yeah. who spoke at the recent New York City EIR conference uh, two weeks ago. So we really are rallying a, uh, uh, a leadership force, which is uh, receiving increased coherence because of what you have done and really what you've done ever since you identified exactly what Obama was going all the way back to the beginning of his first term in April of 2009. This is because it involves the Republican and Democratic parties. Right. And the Democratic Party is actually, has no depth to it anymore. It has numbers, but not depth. Right. And the Republican Party is responding, and I think the response is largely coming from what happened in the New York app, app, appellate court. That, that that really profound, provided the foundations for a systemic uh, thing. And, and the other part is that the court system is different than the uh, candid candidacies of the, uh, two, the two parties mm -hmm. and, and the two institutions. So that that's also a factor. And I pointed, you have, the question is, are there patriots in various institutions and are they trying to concentrate their fire right. by some institutions backing up other institutions and in moving this operation. It certainly is apparent to anyone who is serious, first of all, that we are threatened with thermonuclear fusion of war, of war. Yeah. Uh, and that would be fatal for humanity. That's a factor. Mm -hmm. But then previously, where with you with had this uh, democratic landslide atmosphere, it went in a different direction. It also, the point was that the Congress has not been reliable in this process. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the courts intervene and related things which are, are court-like in their characteristics come into play, which is what's happening now. It's on points of investigation like a criminal trial. Every time the t thing turns around, another charge is made against the criminal. Right. And it, this is acting just like a action of the court system, the federal court system who is acting when the Republicans and Democrats lost the, uh, the guts to take this thing on. So I think we've got these two processes, and, and despite the fact that the uh, political parties have failed, mm -hmm. nonetheless, the fact is that they, they do not want to be excluded. So they are under tremendous pressure to come back and behave themselves. And it is just interesting that it's not only Republicans. You also had, I mean, leading the point on this uh, demand that the secret memo on assassinations be released is Ron Wyden, who is a Democratic senator from Oregon. Uh, in fact, this letter that was published last week, there were 11 senators who uh, demanded that Obama release this memo, eight of whom were Democrats. So it is a uh, superseding of the party separation. Yeah, but th these complications of 
who is doing exactly what to whom. Right. But I, I would say I would bet on the, the, what the Republicans have done, or the, the courts have done, rather than the Republicans as such, that what the courts have done, the federal courts have done, yeah. is probably most significant because yeah. it's the, the court system which is out in the open on these rulings on this kind of matter <clears throat> is a fewer number of people and you can't hide <laughs> things <laughs> the way you can in the, in the two houses of, of Congress. Mm -hmm. But at, I, I, that's what I'm watching because I see this thing in the end is what's the most important. Right. Because we need a conclusion. Uh, the typical thing for my worry is if we do not get a Glass-Steagall through mm -hmm. before anything in, in terms of important legislation is brought to uh, conclusion, then we are really in deep trouble. And that's the thing you have to really look at. I mean, all these issues are, in terms of this, are real, they're significant, some of them are questionable, but so forth. But the real thing in here is we cannot save the United States, or probably couldn't, unless we can get Glass-Steagall through first. Right. If we get Glass-Steagall through, then the addition of a, uh, another feature to Glass-Steagall, which is the credit system, could be added, but it would be better to have the whole thing in one package. But if necessary, we get the two packages. First of all, the idea of the, uh, the entire Glass-Steagall as such, and that saves the nation. And I don't know how well people out there understand what that means in terms of saving the nation. Because if we get Glass-Steagall through, most of the holdings of the other kind of bank mm -hmm. is going down the sewer system. Well, that's not, that's not a bad thing to gloat over. That's a good thing because th that money is, is fraudulent. The whole thing is fraudulent. Right. And there's nothing wrong with bankrupting people who commit frauds on the crowds <laughs> of, those, of, of those things. So the point is we need the Glass-Steagall immediately. Mm -hmm. We need it because that's our only insurance to save the nation. And what we're doing also in our back room work, our own back room work on this thing, on Glass-Steagall and its implications. Mm -hmm. that, that's the thing I, which I'm most concerned about. Get Glass-Steagall in. As I spoke last Friday, right. get Glass-Steagall in and we can work our way to solve the other things that need to be cleaned up. If we don't get Glass-Steagall in first, mm -hmm. we are in a mess. You know, one example of that um, is that I, in New Jersey right now, and I found out also in Connecticut, and it's probably the case in many states, the legislatures are introducing so-called right-to-die legislation. So they are going on a push to kill you. And it's in the name of saving money so we can bail out these criminal entities. So we're going to kill off the population. And the idea of death with dignity is so outrageous I mean, where is there a poor soul somewhere who's been forced to live for 500 years? <laughs> that is, everybody dies. We haven't, you don't need a special right to be guaranteed the right to die. It is going to happen to each one of us. So the, the, it is just, and two days earlier, the front page of the paper had had a column, and I don't know if it was related to the weight of the governor or not, but they wanted to point out that people who smoke live 10 years shorter on the average than people who don't, and people who are obese live four years shorter on average than people who it's are not obese. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the conclusion, of course, was, well, if people are going to engage in this behavior, we should not spend any money on health care for people who smoke or people who are obese. And then the next thing you hear is about the right to die legislation. So it really struck me when you said, get Glass-Steagall before anything. I mean, they are literally going to kill us off if we don't get this done. Well, if they're going to kill us off, what you'll get is you'll get a Thermonuclear War. <clears throat> and nobody will be alive. Mm -hmm. And the point is you've got a foolish people who don't really understand what their situation is. <laughs> and it's largely because they don't want to understand. I mean, sometimes, you know, when cowardly people are faced with threats which they can't think about, that they act that way. They just don't see what they don't want to see. And the point is that Glass-Steagall, that installation, 
is the only thing that will enable us, not by itself, but it's the only thing, if passed now, is the only thing that could save the world. So they better get serious about it. Well, I do think also that this is the what you laid out very uh, succinctly on Friday with your webcast was that, <clears throat> and I think a lot of the people within the institutions who think about you know what happens when you actually get Obama out, that this is what you were laying out you know on Friday, what you did with the webcast on this single integrated conception of Glass-Steagall, the credit system, the WAPA, SDE as the advanced uh, component of a physical economic recovery. But what has dawned on me is that the institutions, if they don't have a sense of what to replace Obama with, then they're not going to move. And, and this, because I think they look and they see that it's bigger than Obama. And, you know, somebody like this Brennan guy where uh, intimately tied with this whole Saudi 9-11 apparatus, this drone killing policy, the, and, and they see this as a single monolithic fascist structure that they don't quite know how to deal with, uh, that it has ties into the, the international banking cartel and so forth. And, and therefore, if they can see what we uniquely know is how to bring this rotten evil system down and what to replace it with, then something like throwing out this this petty criminal Obama would just be the the uh, you know the a no brainer. So um, so I think that 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 question of uh, getting it into the mindset of the American people, the relevant institutions, on what the new paradigm actually looks like that we're going to get rid of the whole apparatus that has controlled Obama and controlled Bush and Cheney, but obviously under Obama in a much worse degree, but that's what we get into their minds, and then the issue of getting him out is, like I say, becomes uh, self-evident. The other thing on this oligarchical question, I was thinking about how stupid people are who think in the party system, because all these people voted for Obama, saying, well, he's not Bush, he's a Democrat, so we're going to vote for him. And then you you see it unfold, and he does all these criminal things, and people keep saying, well, well, you know, somehow this was started another way. And what you have now with the court ruling is what you said, that, that the party lines are shattered and Obama is losing his so-called base, whatever it was, like the drone killings. Uh, the, the ambassador from Pakistan to the U.S. reported that there were 267 drone strikes on Pakistan. Of the 267 drone strikes, they've killed 20, we have killed 2,500 people. 21 of those occurred during the Bush administration. So Obama, in half as long, has committed 10 times the atrocities. And this is becoming inescapable. Once you have the court ruling, you have the Senator Wyden question, you have the Benghazi, there's no place else for anyone with one little millimeter of honesty to look. And then you have to get a higher level and look at the British in this. That's what you, in particular, were gone after for for years is identifying the British Empire and here you have Tony Blair running Bush's war on Iraq and coming in and running the Obama campaign and running our attack on to overthrow the government of Syria so you have this continuous red dye you could call it in the form of Tony Blair but I think this is something Americans really have got to get. They get nervous about it because <clears throat> What they get nervous about me about is several things. One is the, the British question on the Queen. Well, mm -hmm. the Queen is a drug pusher. <laughs> I mean, it's been well established. I, I don't know what, what they need. You know? But it's... Uh, you know, the, the, the problem is they don't have any sense of identity, security, and so forth. They just close their minds. People just close their minds to reality if they don't, if they don't want to face it. They run to, into a hiding place 
It's like they stick their heads down a toilet and they say, look, I'm protected. <laughs> it's, it's that kind of thing that you're dealing with. And that's a very commonplace kind of thing. But on the British side, the problem it, it is, which is vulnerable, is that the British Empire is a British Empire. And a matter of fact, it is a continuation of the original Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire, where there had been other systems, which are very large systems, they didn't have that character of the Roman Empire did as a legal system as mm -hmm. such. Mm -hmm. And thus, you had, then you had the two Venetian systems coming in. Yeah, and then uh, the second Venetian system that came in was the one that led to the establishment of the British, uh, British uh, government, the British system, mm -hmm. as a, an empire. So the, what you're dealing with, you, the fact is that Saudi Arabia is a part of the British Empire. And we caught them that on the 9-11 business because it was the, in the 9-11 that Saudis and others, uh, including Saudi officials, actually organized 9-11 with the support and participation of the British, the British monarchy. Now you say, well, what, what, did the British, is the Saudis are part of the British monarchy? <clears throat> yes, but it's not just them. You have, you take, take the international banking system. And what is the international banking system in this process? That is the empire. You trace it. That's exactly how the Saudis and British were together on 9-11 because of the BAE, mm -hmm. which is the funding of the whole thing. But the same thing was, it was done again with the, with the other bosses. The idea is to save the money system. Now, the problem here is that most people are rather stupid, is they assume that the problem, the issue is money. The issue is not money. The issue, the issue of money is that people are stupid enough to believe in it. The issue is credit because money does not guarantee you anything. As you see now from Bernanke, money ain't worth anything and neither is Bernanke. In fact, because there's nothing fungible in what he does. So therefore, what's the issue? The issue is the basis of the growth of nations and the development and saving of nations is based on credit. Mm -hmm. That is, you, you allow, even money depends upon credit. Money, unless it has backing of credit, is worthless. I mean, there are a few things like the metal substances that are used as money, and they, are, they, are, they can be bought and sold on their own account. But when you have try to get a surrogate for money, and you get, that's all you have, you don't have anything. So the problem here is that the obstacle is that people believe that their vital personal interests depend upon money, which is not true. Money could be completely canceled as money. I could cancel it as money, from what I know, mm -hmm. as long as I have credit. Because credit is based on the fact that the, a government, along with other institutions associated with government, give credit, as we did with the, in, the, in the case of the first you know, presidency of the United States. We gave credit. And people would get that credit. They would pay off the credit when the crop was delivered or when the product was delivered. And so you would have these patterns in the United States where the agriculture was a big factor, and every, every season of harvesting of the agricultural product was a time to settle the matter of credit. Mm -hmm. huh? So what we all we really need is a credit system which is designed on the same principle that Alexander Hamilton specified. We don't need money. We only use some money, which is based on uh, actually ho owning something that could be turned into money because it has an intrinsic value of that type, physical value. But in general, we don't need money. We need credit. But we also need somebody to produce the product that corresponds to that credit. So the basis of, of wealth is production, not money. Money is simply a convenience when it's used as credit 
as a short-term kind of credit. And what is valuable is the creation of wealth in a, in a, a timely fashion. And that's, that, so the fact that people are obsessed with money per se, the very idea of clinging, cringing before this money god, uh, <laughs> is, is the way that they are made stupid. Because they believe, they keep talk among themselves, they believe in the need for money. Well, they don't need money as such. They need a form of money which is circulated as credit. Credit in terms of payment for production. And that, that's what our biggest problem is the fact that they're vulnerable to this idea that they need money per se. And money per se, except for when it's in a metallic or some equivalent form, has no intrinsic value. And you have to think about what does have intrinsic value. Producing something that somebody can eat, wear, or so forth, that's, that's credit. Or the long term of building up an industry, a factory, an industry. Yeah, it takes time for that investment to work its way off in terms of obligations. But that's the fact that people don't see things that way. And they, since we are in a post-industrial society, that a post-agricultural society as well, we're turning, we're turning food into fuel, right. uh, that that's what the problem is. That's the intellectual problem. Going back to what you brought up, Lynn, on this legal process, the fact that everything that's coming down around Obama is more and more uh, violate, you know, uh, bringing out his violations of the Constitution. There was also a report in the Daily Mail that o Obama had Delta forces on the ground in Libya, uh, supposedly as analysts, but that they were actually training militant forces, which would mean that we did have boots on the ground uh, and Obama's <laughs> defense for not going to, to war, that we had no troops on ground, was, you know, another lie. And that, that is the character of, of oligarchy and empire, is lie. You know, the intentions to kill, and you set up the, the uh, uh, preconditions to do that, and you tell people uh, what you need, need so that they'll accept those policies. Uh, but I think that the principle now of, it's the Constitution, stupid, is <laughs> valid, and that that's, that's um, I think that's an important factor of what's going on. Well, it, it is very important. I mean, even the, uh, the declaration of war, the fact that Libya uh, and everything else that Obama has done has been done without, including all these drone killings, without a declaration of war, uh, means that it's, it's not, uh, these are not lives that are taken in a legal war that this is murder. Yeah, exactly. the, the thing that separates murder from <coughs> some sort of legal battle, battlefield kind of uh, casualty is a declaration of war. And that's absolutely what a president without approval of Congress is, is guilty of. Would be, yeah. No, the, the killing thing itself is a, it's, this, this thing is like, guess who? The Emperor Nero. Exactly. No difference. What did I say in 2009? Emperor Nero. Mm -hmm. What's happening now? Emperor Nero. That, that reflects on the fact that what we have is a continuous existence of an empire. The unbroken existence of an empire, mm -hmm. which was originally the Roman Empire, and everything since then has been a continuation of the Roman Empire. And that's the vulnerable point. And the, the most vulnerable point that I raised in 2009 when I saw what the devil we were getting, and that's what we're getting, was the fact, that fact, mm -hmm. that this guy essentially is equivalent to the Emperor Nero. And since he's like the Emperor Nero, he's also therefore like Adolf Hitler. And people can't say that. They can't even say the Emperor Nero is, was a killer, a bad, bad killer. And that he's like the Emperor Nero in his personality, which was a matter of, you know, Time Magazine gave all the evidence, mm -hmm. pointing to all the evidence that Obama is a reincarnation, in effect, of the Emperor Nero. He's a killer, a mass killer without law, just like the Emperor Nero. And that's what they're seeing. 
That's what all these kills are. And the Bush family is no damn good on this either. I mean, the, the, the beginning, my first Bush case was a guy who actually uh, supported Adolf Hitler. As a matter of fact, he supported him to run for leader of Germany. Right. Um, Prescott. Uh, <coughs> Prescott Bush. And then Prescott Bush, and then his son, uh, Dopey Bush, and then the other one, the drunken Bush. <laughs> And we, we didn't get the burning bush yet. <laughs> well, I think that it is uh, extremely important to go back to what you were just discussing on this question of the monetary system versus the understanding of what a real credit system is. and. Uh, this really gets to the patriotic faction in our nation, the, the patriotic forces versus the treasonous forces typified by Aaron Burr, Andrew Jackson, and Van Buren. And, I mean, you just think about tomorrow is the birthday uh, of, of Lincoln. And if anybody understood, uh, along with John Quincy Adams, why it is that in order to really go after the empire, to go after this tyranny and this, this oligarchical system, you actually had to have a basis of understanding of what the credit system represented as a process of the creative powers and the progress of the human mind and of your society. And everything that Lincoln did and everything that John Quincy Adams did was very uh, indicative of that understanding versus the idea of what you had, the, the understanding that a monetary system is a system of slavery, is a system that uh, is set forward to keep people from actually progressing. A uh, monetary system is to keep an empire going as what we're seeing right now with the fight around Glass-Steagall. You, know, you think about the fact that many people are coming out right now saying that uh, we got to keep bailing out these bankrupt banks. Uh, we cannot pros uh, prosecute the um, gambling and illegal activities of these bank uh, uh, of these speculators and these derivatives and so forth. Um, but I mean, this is what Lincoln understood, or what John Quincy Adams, or even going to Kennedy and, and Roosevelt understood, is that uh, the real purpose of and the real uh, you know production of society lie lies in not how much money you're printing and pumping into a system, but what you're actually producing. And I think this is exactly what you've been getting at as. This is why we have to win this fight for Glass-Steagall, because it's not just a fight for a bill or a policy, but it is a fight over this empire uh, and their uh, control over the, over the systems of government, uh, control over sovereign nation states, and saying that people have no right to develop. I think we're having another message this uh, week that should be a wake-up call as well. Coming up this Friday is the asteroid flyby yeah. a very close call. This is, uh, you know, uh, at the level of our geosynchronous satellite orbits. Uh, and if it was one fraction of a degree different, a collision with either the Earth or even a collision with the moon would prove to be very dangerous to the human species. And, um, you know, this, I think, puts on the table a question that, uh, goes even beyond just uh, the danger of a hyperinflation looming or something like that. But what, the point that you made last Friday, that the retrograde motion in terms of technology, in terms of technological level of the human species over the last 50 years, has uh, put us in the position where we would not be prepared to defend the human race from this kind of uh, asteroid collision or similar cat catastrophe. And that is, a, that is the prospect of the death of mankind because of a negligence or a, a retrograde 
motion in the level of technological capability. It's important to expand that argument uh, from the specific case, which is, of course, relevant. Because what was needed, we have to create a system which would be the equivalent of an economic system. And as I've been working on a piece, which I'll get out soon, mm -hmm. what we have to do is, is think about why we have to be able to reach Mars. Now, at present, I wouldn't be recommending anyone to go live on Mars. I would, I, we, can, we can use the moon for some things. It's, it has problems there. But once we have thermonuclear fusion as a power source and organized in a certain way, we could reach from the moon to Mars in a weekend or something of that like that nature. At that point, the idea of uh, experimental tests of you know, systems and that which can could keep people alive under that gravity condition will be feasible. Mm -hmm. But for the present, we don't have any specific feasibility for this type of man landing and doing performing operations on Mars, though we could and must be able to do that at some point down the line. What's needed is, is essentially is to develop now a system of not quite automated, but more than automated uh, operations involving Mars and, and asteroids and so forth. That clearly, now we could know how to do that. Uh, since uh, cases of NASA operations comparable to what was done uh, before, as, as in this case of, of you know, the, the recent, more recent one on Mars, uh, that uh, the, we can now already begin to build systems which we can implant on Mars, which will be part of keystone, as, so to speak, of speech, of where you can actually begin to control what goes on between Earth and Mars by building up these systems, mm -hmm. which we plant things on asteroids and, or do other things, similar kinds of things, we can begin to develop an effective system. We can, the, such a development of the system will also improve our intelligence capability to do what we cannot do officially now, is make sure we catch these things in time. And that's what I think is, uh, it, it is actually defines more than even the food question now. Mm -hmm. It defines the, the, what is needed for the security of mankind over times to come. Right. And the time that we actually have a, a set of systems which are implanted on Mars, which are systems which also give us information from Mars to be applied to this whole look, search of asteroids and similar kinds of things, that must be done now, it must be done immediately. It, we must shift from this idea of merely defense against one object that may come around us. We've got to go further. We've got to say, what kind of a system, since we as human beings are confined to the vulnerable place called Earth, why aren't we doing something to provide us better protection in the whole volume of space that the Earth occupies as a as orbital space to make sure that mankind is going to live. Now that leads us then to higher forms of technology, again, automatically, which lead mankind to a new conception of mankind's role. Eventually we're going to have to think about the fact that the sun has a limited existence. Not only does it have a limited existence, it's estimated around two billion years, but the, there's another question. At what point will the process of deterioration of the sun bring us to the point that we can no longer tolerate the sun as a neighbor? Mm -hmm. Now that's a, some distance from, from now, but you have to keep started in a direction which is going to lead to the point at which you can get out of this threat. Uh, as human beings. And that's going to take some time, but it's also going to take some work. So we're on a course where we have many threats within the solar system, among other things. And we have to deal with the comet problem also. So therefore, we, have, we, have, we should be thinking about what we are doing now in order to ensure that we have a habitable place for the human species to perpetuate itself. You know, it's not only even... Um uh, protection against, you know, defense against negative uh, uh, effects. But if you think about, for example, what Roosevelt did with the TVA, this river was 
uh, a, the enemy of the people who lived in this area. It was flooding, it was bringing malaria, it was washing away the topsoil. And not only did Roosevelt mitigate and tame that river, but he also harnessed it and put it to work for the power of the people who lived there with yeah. hydroelectric dams and better irrigation. You know, there's a study that was done by a Chinese uh, space research agency that showed that not only could you change the orbit of an asteroid, not only could you deflect the orbit of an asteroid so that it wouldn't collide with Earth, but it's actually feasible to harness an asteroid to put it into orbit around Earth, at least temporarily, and you could even begin to mine that asteroid. So you could turn something which seems like a threat to mankind into a benefit. So therefore they would say then that the green policy, which is uh, in itself assures the extinction of the human species. Right. You can't get by with that, you know. So therefore that's what we're up against. We, mankind must use science driver programs, mm -hmm. starting with the now proper use of thermonuclear fusion power. We must start to do that because that will enable us to begin moving. Once we get into space with the mankind's ability to operate in space, mm -hmm. that is on another planetary surface and so forth, then everything is reversed. If mankind moves into this area, the power of mankind within this solar system increases beyond the, the imagination. Mm -hmm. Now man, instead of defending himself in, in a losing battle against attrition, now is out there and acquiring power like he, mankind has never dreamed of before. And then we can begin to fix our own problems. <laughs> Well, in a, in a period in which parents are even afraid to think about what kind of world their children are going to grow up in, and people lack the memory to even recognize what, is, what has been continuous between the Bush administration and the Obama administration, I mean, the, the idea of being on the verge of, of organizing a society in which people will think several generations in the future is a very optimistic idea. And I just think about yeah, I think about some of the founding fathers, uh, Benjamin Franklin, thinking about the day in which we'll be in hot air balloons and, 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 and in airplanes, and John Quincy Adams' idea about the development of instruments that you know, allow us to, to peer further into space. I mean, this, this really is what we have degenerated from as a, as a population. And, uh, this is a very exciting idea that not only can, can we, we get, get Obama, Obama out now, uh, but it, it lies the ability to transform the population sense of imagination, which has been the real problem politically, is, is within our grasp. Somebody's going to, some wag is going to say to President Obama, we have, one, we have a trip for you. <laughs> we have an option for you. <laughs> we have space for you. Mr. <laughs> Raleigh's not productive. Well, I think that this uh, discussion is, continues to uh, be very, very important as we uh, get closer to the uh, anniversary of Reagan's SDI speech, which is coming up on March 23rd. And we are organizing for a... Uh, an event to commemorate that date and to kick off the revival of the SDI, STE policy. Um, so as we get closer to that point, I think that this is going to gain ever increasing relevance. And we're going to, we're going to be doing something about that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right in the days ahead. Exactly. Well, hopefully part of what we'll be doing is getting getting together around the common aims of mankind because I think I think that's the point. <laughs> we're we're at the potential of a revolution and we have to seize it. You have to end defeatism. Yes. Right. And not only do we have Nero in the White House, but we also have the image of Richard the Third. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of my distant relatives, very distant, however. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Keep him at a distance. <laughs> Keep him that way, yes. 
Good. Okay, I think uh, that brings a good conclusion to our show today. I thank you for watching, and thank you everybody for joining us over Skype. And uh, please stay tuned to LaRouche Pack TV, and we will be seeing you soon.